very good afternoon everyone i welcome you all to today's uh, webinar on uh, schedule 3 and caro reporting as you all know that uh, there are a lot of changes which has happened in the schedule 3 uh, and uh, caro with respect from 1st of april 2021 which will be applicable for this year and at the same time you know uh, there is a need which is continuously being felt now with respect to the compliance with uh, with respect to finding of annual returns, it is being observed that you know, though the accounts are prepared finally, if it is not there in the proper format of the company's act, the MCA is now strictly following and sending notices to professionals who have been attesting the accounts. So it is high time that we educate ourselves and you know to ensure that the financials what we are filing are proper. And in these lines. We had uh, we had a discussion in the month of February, sir. So my thing it's like you know, four months now to have this program because uh, March and uh, April was bank audit and I don't know, yeah, those months we finally uh, thought that we'll have in the month of first week of uh, May. So we had, you know, there was only one speaker who is coming in everyone's name, like B. Ganesh. And uh, she, in fact, it was Srinivasan, sir, has uh, proposed your name and everyone uh, said yes. So <clears throat> we thank sir, B. Ganesh, sir for uh, taking this uh, webinar and uh, I welcome you all everyone for uh, joining on to this webinar. Over to Secretary Sir. Yes. Thank you Sir for your uh, nice welcome address to today's speaker. Now I request to see Pia Hide Jain to introduce the speaker to this August program. Yeah, my, my request here, please, please don't I don't need any introduction, please. I, I sincerely request uh, more than enough. Um, you know, probably you should in, introduce people like uh, uh, if there are any commissioners, commissioners that will really be helpful other than me. All right. So please don't, and it's not a disrespect, but I don't like people to get into my anger. Okay. All right. So if, 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 with due respects to Jane, so, uh, so please don't mind uh, because I'm against any introductions. So thank you very much. Uh, as I said, there are certain things which I believe um, is, you know, when it comes to in relation to exchange of knowledge or sharing of knowledge, I always believe that uh, we as professionals have to contribute to this. If we don't contribute, then I think it's a, it's a, it's a non-start. I think that's where it is. What I'm going to do today is whilst you know. Uh, there is this set set of practices that goes through in terms of, uh, you know, what is in Schedule 3, what is in CARO. Let me give you a perspective as to what is the intent behind this. And I think if you understand the intent behind getting the changes, probably you're in a bit, much better position to appreciate it. And also you're in a much better position to implement it. Fortunately or unfortunately, what has happened for all of us is that we believe that whenever there is a caro, whenever there is a changes in schedule three or any, any financial statements. Financial statements is the responsibility of the management and your responsibilities in the audit report. Your audit report is only restricted to what is called as balance sheet, profit and loss account and notes to accounts, cash flow and notes to account. Caro always used to figure as not applicable, as it is, uh, is that up, it is in line with it. All of that just be the more like saying that, giving an affirmative saying that whatever is the clauses says, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. That's how it is to happen. But what has happened now is Caro's, the very purpose of looking at when you someone looks at Caro itself, it looks like that is a long form audit report for every chartered accountant. Uh, if long form audit report is a very something which is they're used to it. That means when they go for a bank audit and that's the excitement where they have the bank audits, they go and fill up all of those information in the long form audit. You have to go on answering each part of it. Anything. So now today when you look at CARO, CARO is an enhanced validation or verification of information, factual information. Why I'm saying this is factual information? Financial statements gives you a true and fair view because you examine books, records, and say that it is in line, is in line with accounting principles, practices, standards, and all of that. 
But when it comes to Caro, you're doing what is called fact finding. You're actually looking at facts and reporting on facts. When you're reporting on facts, you need to do verification of it. In an audit, you don't, while you do, whilst you do a verification, here you have to complete the verification. So there is a fact finding because suppose somebody says in the Caro that information that has to be validated on a quarterly basis, is it in agreement with the books and records? So you have to see what is the information provided, what is the information as per books, compare both this and then report. This is called fact finding. So the biggest change that has come through, Caro is no longer what is called as information that is produced based on whatever audit you perform. Here, specific tests have to be done in respect of that. And it has got significant change. So let me take you through uh, for the understanding. And in case you're not able to hear me, please pause or please raise a point. So therefore, I'll go back and then um, again, speak on the same thing. Uh, just confirm to me in case if the voice is not audible. But again, voice not audible, I just want to make sure that is the problem at your end, my end, because what is important is many times the that, you know, you may have a connectivity issue. If majority of them have an issue, please let me know on that part of it. Mr. So Reddy, it's clear, right? It is okay, sir. Please go ahead. All right. So today we are going to touch upon the Caro report itself, the key factors, considerations, what you need to do, amendments to Schedule 3, and guidance towards this. Now, let me bring back this concept we had there are actually three reports that we issue first report is audit report on financial statements second is audit report on internal control or financial reporting third one is companies auditors report order 2020 so these three reports that we issue the first report is based go on to the basic records do a very sampling, do your use your materiality, use everything, get draw as per requirement and report. The second and the foremost thing is report on internal control or financial reporting. Our biggest problem with that we have seen today that internal control reporting is a biggest failure. In fact, if you find that if internal control reporting had succeeded, the Caro enhancement was not required. Because internal control reporting is a failure, even today as I talk, there is not a single report which says that the internal control has got, it has got weaknesses. Look at the irony. That means 10 lakh companies which are operating in India, not a single auditor has got one report on that there is a deficiency in this internal control. Even though where there are issues relating to frauds, even issues relating to certain matters, the internal controls always operate effectively. So that means either we have not understood what is the purpose of internal control, nor the management understood and gives importance to what the internal control is, nor the regulators understand what the internal control is. Why I'm trying to bring this aspect of it is any adverse report in respect of Caro, any adverse report in respect of Caro has an implication on internal control of financial reporting. Somebody may ask, how? Suppose you say, that the fixed asset register, because one of the ask is fixed asset register updated, fixed asset, you have to give particulars, names, and everything. Now, you say that fixed asset register is the process of updation. Physical verification is carried out in a phased manner. As and when the stock physical verification is carried out and this records are updated, discrepancy, any, if any, will be adjusted. You see, any audit car or report, you will have the continuous same thing this year, last year, previous year. Now, let me ask you, because you're all tax per association. So you file tax audit reports. In tax audit reports, you've got addition to fixed assets and you claim depreciation under Section 32. How do you claim? 
if you say there is no asset register, if you say the asset register is in the process of alteration, how did you arrive at greater than 180 days, less than 180 days? And even if you take a simple analysis of year after year after year after year and take that information, that should be sufficient to compile a fixed asset register. So this is the biggest challenge that we have. That means we have not understood. So therefore, you say fixed asset register is not updated. What does your internal control say? Internal control says a fixed asset register, a fixed asset. How do you cap? What is a fixed asset? And when do you capitalize a fixed asset? He says, if I need a cap fixed asset, there should be a capital budget. The budget should be approved. I should place an order. I should bring whatever your normal things of, you know, bringing in quotations or tendering, bring back that, have a purchase or work order released. Based on the work order, get this purchase order, get the material received. Every material received should have an indent. This indent should be again taken, tested for quality and then for installation and then for capitalization. And that's where depreciation starts. Now, if you have laid this down as your control, what is a control failure? You cannot capitalize an asset unless it is ready to use. That is your income tax requirement. Whether put to use is not about, ready to use. So when do you say it's ready to use? Only when it is certified, the trial runs has happened, production has happened, at least there's a certain element. Now, when you have this laid down as your internal control, how can you comment on Caro saying the process of updation? So if you say it is up the process of updation, that means your control on fixed asset is a challenge. Same is the case with inventory. Inventory, it says that in whether the company has a process of carrying out physical version of inventory, whether the inventories are properly identified, if there are descript material discrepancies, whether they've been adjusted. Now, what do you say? And whether it's an earlier concept, was, I'm just giving you an earlier concept. I'll come back with a new concept whether there was a continuing failure or weaknesses. Now, if you say that the inventory verification differences are not material, first of all, what is the process of carrying out physical verification of inventory? What is the nature of industry? Physical verification of inventory is not driven by only a physical verification report. There is a nature of industry. For industries like life sciences, your pharmaceutical industries, it's different. For trading concerns, it is different. For consumer durables, it's different. For steel companies, it is different. For cement companies, it is different. For retail companies, it is different. Your grocery stores, it is different. So what is physical verification? What is a plan for physical verification? Is that a perpetual inventory? Is that is that a verification done every day? Is it a verification done at the end of the month? Is it done once in quarter? Whether you identify A class, B class, it is. Now the question is, if you say that when you carry out a physical verification of inventory and that inventory had differences, now the question is, where did the control fail? Control requires you that you should compare with the book records and find out the reasons. He found out the reasons that it is either the count or the non-existent of inventory. Now, you have done, let's say, in the month of July. You have again done in the month of November. You have done in the month of February. Because of the time period, you have been doing inventory verification like this. Now, at each point in time, there was differences. You have not carried out inventory verification as of 31st of March. Because it is not possible. It's huge material spread across. You will say it's not possible. Now, from an internal control perspective, if you've designed controls to operate in the manner in which you operate, was that operating at the year end? We always test our physical verification was carried out during the year. But did we see from a control perspective? whether that control was still operating as of 31st of March or is a change in control. Now, these are the questions which will come up. And if you have inventory verifications and that discrepancies are noted, it has got a larger implications. So that's the reason why you need to look at it. 
caro today is not a caro of just reporting on that today caro requires you to look at specific aspects of it and report and every variances in respect of those caro will have an impact on in internal controls will have an impact on the financial reporting i'll check tell you on how very very to be now predominantly if you look at caro changes right all the caro changes have been brought in only by inputs from bankers financial institutions and register of companies if you see all changes you take any change whether bank submission of quarterly reports is banker end use of certificate is banker funds drawn terms loan drawn banker whether the all the charges have been created roc so that means in other words what has happened that this caro is basically an information that is being provided to all the regulatory agencies whether you had had adt4 file fraud to the rocs so now question now what has happened so yesterday i was in calcutta one of the speakers said sir we are not astrologers how can we predict whether the assets are available or not to pay the liable how do we predict very valid point if you are not astrologer that's fine astrologer is become one year old so last year he was astrology this year is facts this year you can't say i don't know what has happened this year one year as astrologer i don't know but next year you know the facts right so astrology is only in the unknown terrain whereas when you look into yes. facts you need to validate those facts one person said one one question came up sir we don't know this creditor sir how do we identify creditors they don't give us information because how do i come up with the aging now that is the reason why you have to understand the nature of the client and the business and the environment it is operating if you do not know the client so for instance for instance you will find just put this person on the mute not 2514 Can you just mute this person? Because since you are the host, of course you can do that. Jason is in there, right? Yeah. Thank you. So the question then is, if you say, if you really find in a company, there are about twenty percent or thirty percent of the customers or clients who will contribute eighty percent of the information. That means eighty percent of the transactions are held only with twenty or thirty percent. so therefore at least if you are able to address that 20 or 30 percent which contributes about 80 percent it is much easier to address the aging analysis i'll come back to all of that in the schedule but i'm just telling you what is important for all of us is do we know our client well do we know the what is the client operating at all of these becomes very very critical so the question is which has moved now is from an information and explanation provided because if you had seen in the last caro 2016 or earlier to that 13 and 8 and all of that it says based on the information provided and explanation obtained the company has been generally been regular paying all of this right that has moved so what has changed in 2020 is based on the examination of records in other words you are examining the books and records when you are examining the books and records that is where the issue really comes in so therefore what has moved now is from an in basis of information and explanation now it has moved to what is called seeking evidences and seeking evidences has an impact as far as the concern. we should not wait for caro instead i would say if you do caro first then come back to your audit report you'll be able to address it many of the issues 
because there is a change that has come up in auditor's report in respect of rule 11E and 11F. 11E, which talks about the ultimate beneficial ownerships, and that has a significant impact as far as the loans and advances are concerned. I'll touch upon that. But just imagine, basis of information and explanation, now it has gone to obtaining evidences, and obtaining evidences is a very critical aspect of it. Now, one of the asks which came back, in fact, there is, there is this videos which are also uh, circulating amongst many of the professionals, that what is that we need to take from the company? But if you see majority of us, right, barring few of the firms, if the accounts are prepared by the child accountants. This is a very few cases where you will find accounts getting prepared by the company and provided to the company because they said, anyway, sir, this is schedule three, sir, new thing, sir, we don't know, sir, you are the auditor, sir, you are the expert, sir, and provides you the information. The question is, if you make the client responsible, probably you will get more information. Since you take the responsibility, you will have to find a solution for every of these problems. So therefore, just be mindful that in respect of CARO 2020, you need to seek this information more closely. So let me take you from a concept of the summary and let me take you through specific aspects of it which is required to be addressed the first one is on maintenance property prop records physical verification title deeds revaluation proceedings i put some legends so therefore you will know what what it is important from a legend perspective red means it is very critical amber means that's where you need to seek information um, white means there is again this information has to be sought that is or something which is new, which you need to look at it. So these are some of the things which have been brought in as part of the summary. Now, if you look at certain critical aspects of it relating to recording of unrecording, unrecorded income, willful defaulters, funds raised used for long-term purposes. Again, these are some things which are coming back from the previous times. Raising of funds by the pledging of uh, securities, of subsidiaries and all of that. So all of these have come fraud by the company, on the company, with auditors, whistleblower complaints, internal audit reports considered, non-cash transactions, all of these are means red means it has got to be addressed. These are called red flags. Why I'm saying these are red flags? The red flags is because recently you would have concluded the men the, the bank audits. If you have concluded bank audits, one of the recent circulars sometime in, I think under three months, uh, the RBI came up and said, if there are any entities which has got rates, which have got notices, which have got uh, any sort of uh, non-compliance from any of the regulators, even though the accounts could look good, they still may need to be considered as a red flag account and that such banks needs to carry out a forensic audit. This is a very critical aspect of it. I'm not sure, I'm sure many of you, as a part of the bank reporting, you would have looked at it as red flag accounts. But this red flags means are very, very important aspects. There are other aspects relating to internal controls that has been highlighted. There are other aspects relating to performance indicators because it all, you need to look at the performance indicators and also touch upon some of the key ratios that we need to talk about. Other aspects is on the compliances that need to look at. So let's look focus on specific things. Again, when you compare this with revised schedule three, uh, you will find whatever information. Now, let me give you a background as this why this was required. If you look at, you know, the CARO 2020 was introduced, even the Institute came up with a guidance note. Institute of Child Accountants came up with a guidance note, whereas Schedule 3 was not changed. Now, the quest, real question came up is, who is the owner of these financial statements? Who prepares these financial statements? Who approves these financial statements? If the approval is done by, if the owner of this financial statement is the company, preparer is of the, the management, approval is by the directors. If you don't make changes, 
on what basis will the auditors approve give an opinion because today if you see any opinion on attest function whether it is a certificate whether it is an information it says management has to certify after that the auditor certifies and that is the reason why a schedule 3 was revised and you will find many of this informations have been captured as a part of schedule 3 that means notes to accounts have got enhanced in respect of title deeds in respect of proceedings in respect of working capital limits and various other aspects of it has been introduced so therefore it is critical that you need to look at it that whenever you are looking reporting on auditors report see whether there is an information that is captured and signed off by the management maintenance cost records depositing statutory dues under dispute these all will come as part of the contingent liabilities and all and liabilities itself recording of unrecorded income companies will full defaulters term loans applied by the obtaining the purpose application of money is raised during debts interest all of these gets captured as part of that so let me if you look at when you compare both from a control perspective and from at this thing you will find that red flags also carried here is about 9 compliance is about 13 performance indicators is about 7 internal controls is about 5 that is where our whole focus should be there in fact because if you don't focus on internal controls you may get it wrong so therefore caro has to be dealt not only from only its own reporting but look at it from a financial statement perspective look at it from a internal control perspective these two aspects have to be covered so let me take you to some of the important clauses while you might be aware of it but it's important that it's better to do what is called rehearse of whatever you know already. so the first and the foremost clause always has been on the fixed assets now it's called the property plant and equipment whether the company is maintaining proper records showing full particulars including quantitative details situation of property plant and equipment it includes ro uss with the right of use assets on investment property non current assets and capital working properties consider factors whatever the records relating to property plant and equipment look at all the information which are impaired which are fully depreciated and all of that from a controls perspective this is where i'm going to look at three aspects of separate company meeting records factors that you need to look at it from a control perspective whether it is complete that's the first thing completeness accuracy and security is very very important now what they have done along with this they have said not only the property plan equipment they also said intangible assets also should be maintaining records now if you really see intangible assets now where do you find this intangible assets you could have software license as an intangible asset you could have if it's a pharma company you could have a drug master files as one of this you could have patents you could have various things which you could be there now for each of these you need to maintain record that means the date on which is capitalized how it is valid now if you look at intangible assets per se intangible assets is always tested from a cash flow perspective from an impairment perspective it is not measured from a sale or something it's basically measured from the cash flows that is able to generate the value in use versus the fair value and then you test for impairment but this information has to be captured it can't be carried out for long but if you see schedule 3 they brought in this capital work in progress and intangible assets under development as a part of the disclosure and i think that that's a very important aspect that needs to be considered when you look at intangible assets now the the other important aspect of it which is again this is coming from a bankers when they when they were looking for a charge or when they were trying to uh, repossess whatever the securities by selling it off which was hypothetical they come came across saying that many of the assets were not in the name of the company now this is a issue which has been there not now it's been there for a long time wherever the title deeds are not in the name of the company especially on the immovable properties it is important that you have to give the see how do you do it one aspect of it is if you got title deeds get a copy of it if it is pledged with the lenders get a confirmation if it is lost then you seek an alternative by filing an fir 
or if it is disputed, provide that. So you have to give them particulars, name, what is it measuring, whether the land, immobile property is building, what is it have, area, place, on whose name it is. Is it in the company's name? If it is not in the company's name, provide the details on whose name. And this typically came up when many of the companies went, went bankrupt or when of the, many of the company's bank lo loans were not serviced, when the, call, the, the, the bankers started calling the loans, at that point in time, when they sought these assets and all of this, they found that the assets are not held in the name of the company. I think this, is a, this issue has been there for long. Now, even today it continues that the bankers takes the collateral security for any of this so that the loans are there. So I think it's important that is not only the security, but the security also should be validated by the bankers on a regular basis. And it's a very important point that to be borne in mind. So if you as an auditor, when you go and seek information, you need to first look at whether the asset exists, who has got the title deeds, if the title deeds are not in the company, who has got it, get a confirmation and all of that. And if it is not in the name of the company, provide this details. Let me give you a live example that we went through very, I mean, I think I would say last year before the car was implemented. You know, many of these transactions which happens, land transactions happens or any of the property transactions, we found that the properties get sold without getting reported to the to the banker or something. So we came with an we we came across a situation wherein the land was sold by more than four years, but the information was not captured in the company. The company was getting it. The bankers were offering confirmations, and every point in time they had this information. The lawyers of the company also were seeking information. The only challenge that which they had is whenever they were getting confirmation from various people, it was not in English. It was other than English. There was no translation done. All it had, let's say, G1, G2, G3, plot number 1, 11, 12. So they all knew that plot number 11, 12. So therefore, they assume that the property is in the name of the company. Now, this is another challenge you need to see. If it is in the local, you need to know. Person who is getting the confirmation should know the local language. If it does not have the understanding of the local language, get a translator, get it translated, and get the translated document, signed translated document, so that you have an understanding of it. Otherwise, what will happen is this. Even though the titles details are provided, the titles may not necessarily be there. So that's a very important point. Then if there are any assets that are revalued, our valuations expert like Ritesh Mittal, the president of uh, tax bar, if he carries out assets, it has to be done only by a registered value. And if there is any change more than 10% in aggregate, such information should be provided. Now, first and the first most, most thing for you as an auditor, it's not whether it is carried out. First of all, you have to evaluate the independence and competence of that registered evaluator, registered valuer. Second, the revaluation cannot be for one asset. The revaluation should be for the entire class of assets. And three, whether the accounting disclosures have been appropriate. I think these are the things which are very, very critical. Just to let you know, registered valuers are those valuers who are appointed under, who are defined under the Companies Act and appointed. Now, in case if there is anything goes wrong on the valuation, they are also considered under section 457 for support reporting. So this is this is the responsibility of a registered valuer. And please look at if there are any such. Benami transactions, especially on prohibition of 1990, 1988. Now, Benami transaction again, you have to get if there have been any such incidents because there's more of a disclosure that you need to bring because you are not you are not supposed to know or investigate whether this property belong to A or the property belong to somebody else. So therefore it is important that you get this information. If there has been any instances of any proceedings initiated against the company, provide information in terms of the nature of property, carrying value, 
status of proceedings and impact and respect of the liability if any this is more from seeking information there is a guidance note which has been issued by ICI. Please look at specific aspect relating to such transactions and such proceedings. The third aspect of it, whether physical verification of inventory has been conducted at reasonable intervals by the management and whether in the opinion of the auditor, the coverage procedure of such verification whether is appropriate, whether any discrepancies of 10% or more in aggregate for each class of inventory were noticed and if so, whether they have been dealt properly dealt with the books of account. Now look at this. First of all, physical verification carrying out at regular intervals. Second, you need to look at it whether the coverage and the procedure adopted by the management was appropriate. Third, when the physical verification is carried out, if there are any discrepancies in excess of 10%, 10% or more, that means in excess of 10, 9.99. If you say really talk me, it's 9.10% or more. For each class of inventory, that means raw material, work in progress, goods in transit, packing material, stores and spare, finished goods, all of these have to be identified. And if there are discrepancies, such discrepancies should be reported. So some questions come up. Sir, the company has only carries out raw metal verification closer to the year, let's say the month of February. So there was discrepancy. Line item discrepancy was there. Now the question then comes up is, should I report in February? So no, no, so March anyway, they've carried out another verification. All of these have got addressed. How do you know these have been addressed? That means that verification process, you need to do a roll forward to see if this discrepancy against exist. But from a reporting perspective, should you now report that 10% were noticed? The answer is yes. You have to report there was a discrepancy. Subsequently, it has been at the year end, it has been adjusted. So, in other words, what happens? You need to be aware of see earlier what it was, whether the company has a product commensurate with the nature and size of business, whether there are material, how it has been dealt with. Now they've focused on specific things. Whether there are reasonable intervals of carry, carrying out verification, whether the coverage and the procedure is appropriate. Where if there are discrepancies arising out of that, how did you deal with it? Each line item. And from a control perspective, you need to see whether the un entire inventories have been covered. You need to look at from a segregation of duties. You need to look at the processes of verification, how it is accounted, and all of this as a part. So just look at it from a just merely reporting on CARO as also implications in respect of the internal controls and this one. Next, whether during any period of time of the year, the company has been sanctioned working capital limits in excess of five crores in aggregate from banks and financial or financial institutions on the basis of security of current assets, whether the quarterly statements, returns or statements filed by the bank with such financial institutions are in agreement of the books accounts, if not provide details. Now, listed company, you can expect them to have closure of books every quarter. Majority of the companies, more than 70% of the companies are micro, small, medium enterprises. Micro, small, medium enterprises companies. Now, if they are going to close somewhere in the month of March, not many companies close in the month of March. Some people might close in the month of April, some in May, some in June, some in July, some in September, some in 30th of September also. Then the question then comes up, how do you determine? So there was one question yesterday that was raised by one of the child accounts saying that, sir, I have found that there are differences. Whatever information that was provided to the bank, the information provided was excess. Whereas as per really, if I were to look at a closure of books, it should be, it should be less. Now the client says, hey Baba, listen, this is our normal practice. 
we don't close books accounts anyway it's during the year how does it make difference whether it you have posted on 30th of september or on october 10th whether you posted on 31st of december whether it's on january 15th now the question then really comes up is if you have differences and let's say you've reported this differences the question then comes up did the company involve in fraud the issue is not just on providing in whether there is an agreement suppose if the company has provided more amounts because it will be able to draw its working capital limits or dp limits is that not fraud in all probabilities it is a fraud because you might say sir that inventory existed it came after 10 days after 15 days but it was there we already committed then the question comes up what is this inventory what is the in co terms what is the commercial terms when do you say it is the risk and rewards are transferred you need to look at from that perspective whenever you have differences quarterly on quarterly on quarterly please report the differences and the date when it was rectified so that for the banker and financial institutions they know that this information is agreement suppose you say it is an agreement of books account and they appoint some stock auditor stock auditor comes back and says sir they don't have books and records whatever physical verification is their books and records and therefore whatever the auditor has reported is not correct just think through that possible the answer is yes so therefore it is important that from a control in fact this is exactly what i said from a control perspective to closure of books is it done quarterly basis it is done half yearly basis is it done yearly basis what it is done so the closure of accounts is very very essential and critical so for us as auditors it's not alone of what information is got whether this information provided has resulted in unjust rich enrichment that means unjust enrichment means what you are not entitled you have got much more than that there is a likelihood the banker can based on on your report can turn back and say the company has intentionally claimed a larger drawing power and therefore i am recalling from a fraudulent perspective there is every likelihood why i am saying this is very important again that is the reason re emphasizing that today's caro has got a much larger implication than the caro that was there of 2016 2013 2008 and all of that be mindful when you are doing it see you know the saying is if and in fact i would take the quotation of the president current president uh, dr debishish he says if you are if you are not in if you are not doing a not if the audit is not done in a as a serious business just be out of it oh sorry audit is a serious business if you are not con you're not serious about it just be out of it there are larger implications in other words it meant that if you want to be an auditor and if you're assigning assigning any reports take audit as seriously as any other tax or any other work that you do don't take audit just because you're you have to just certify some please do not compromise on this aspect of it because as much as in gst when there has been arrest made for the chartered accountants in respect to chartered accountants there is every likelihood when the notices comes in fact ritesh was mentioning about notices received because tally accounts being filed the same thing can come back from the bankers now it is not the roc it's from the banker saying that please confirm to us what is the nature of differences whether it tantamounts to fraud please be aware of this change when the audit report goes away again banks financial institutions everything gets covered in respect of it next whether during the year the company has made investments provided any guarantees or securities or granted any loans or advances in the nature of loans secured or unsecured company or any other part is there are various questions that you need to look at especially you need to look at information that have been filed 
in the form MVP2. Now, these transactions are applicable to all the parties. There is nothing related to related parties. Earlier, it used to be with related parties. Now, to any other parties, you need to understand the policies. Now, this is very, very important. Whether during the year the company had made investments, provided any guarantee or security, any loans, this is the nature of information that you need to capture. Nature of loan, nature of advances, aggregate balances, whether the interest is prejudicial to the interest, whether the schedule of payment has been stipulated and regularly, whether there have been overdue more than 90 days, whether there have been renewals, extension, fresh loans to the same parties, whether loans either payable on demand, having no loans and so on. Now look at all of these aspects of it. You have to first information, information segregate between your subsidiaries, joint venture associates and other parties. Then you need to identify the amount of loan at which the interest you have provided, whether it is prejudicial to the interest of the company. Three, you need to address whether what steps have been taken to recover if the out amounts are outstanding beyond 90 days. Next, you need to look at if there are any rollover of loans, that means renewal, fresh loans, or extension granted to sell to the existing loans. Next, loans payable which have got no terms and terms. This comprehensive is applicable to loans, advance in the nature of loans, guarantees, security, investments, and reporting is transaction during the year, at the end of the year, and if there are any transactions related to previous year. Now, if you look at all of these informations, that means you should actually have done entire schedule with you. That means entire ledger balances, you should have gone and validated it. It's a very important change that you need to be mindful of. Next, in respect of loans, investments, guarantees, security, where the provisions of 185, have been complied with. If not, that means, for instance, these are loans which are given to subsidiaries. These are also, uh, there are restrictions in number of loans that it can give not more than two layers. So you need to evaluate exception as being the subsidiary companies. So you need to, whilst the section is not applicable to wholly owned subsidiary companies, but for any loans that you have provided, you need to look at the controls, the evaluation and respect of that. I'm not getting into section 73 to 76, which is basically the company's acceptance of deposits. Again, be mindful that under the Companies Act, if there are any amounts, undisputed amounts more than 365 days in the nature of advance, remaining unsettled, that means those also comes under deemed deposits. So you need to be mindful of that. Cost records is again, come back, look at the applicability, look at the records that are being maintained. The other aspect which is very important is the changes in the statutory rules. In the erstwhile car, you at least had to have specific which was identified. Now you find the GST has been included, Provident Fund employee, employee state is all, already was existing, but any other statutory reduced to the appropriate authorities. That means they've identified statutory reduce to anyone it could be federal, it could be state, it could be local authority, it could be Gram Panchayat, it could be municipality, it could be anyone. This is something which is important for the company to look at it from a statutory reduce perspective and your reporting becomes important. So all statutory reduce is comprehensive. Is it by statute? Statutory reduce is by statute. Is it by statute you need to include? Even an effluent treatment cess could be part of the statute. So the, the statutory dues have been expanded to include many of these matters. Next, base statutory dues referred to the clause have not been deposited, then you have to give the nature of the dispute and all of this. This is again, you know, the, there is no distinction between material amounts or non-material amounts. All information requires to be given. So should you give salaries and wages as a part of it? No. Payment of bonus is only by the statute. Salaries and our wages are basis of your con basis of your contractual obligation. Unless 
wages are covered under the minimum wages act you may probably need to look at it from that perspective i'm just answering the question because it's popped up uh, from one mr satnana next whether any transactions not recorded in the books of accounts have been surrendered or disclosed as income during the year in tax assessment if so whether the previously unrecorded income has been properly recorded in the books of accounts now this is a very important aspect as an auditor if you have been the statutory auditor your client goes back and says to buy pc sir wo bahut sata raha hai sir isko 15 crore de denge sir 10 crore de denge sir 20 crore de denge the question is and there you say unexplained expenditure or unexplained income so therefore you are surrendering so two things comes into picture when you have surrendered unexplained expenditure so from a control perspective what you would have done that means the controls have failed somewhere the expenditures have gone which is not recorded or revenues are record done not recorded but from a financial statement perspective does it tantamount to reopening of accounts or restatement of accounts now under this revised schedule 3 you got division 1 division division 3 anything changes in division 1 you will go under what is called as a restated restated financial statement or restated balance sheet this is one change that is very important that you need to look at it if any of such amounts are surrendered or a tax is paid you need to evaluate it from whether you need to reopen the previous books and definitely you need to qualify the internal control you may also have to qualify the trueness and fairness in respect of such transactions next whether the company has defaulted in repayment of loans or other borrowings or in the payment of interest there on to any lender that means we need to have the entire banks financial institutions and those information should be broken down into when is when is the due date what are the loans when is the due date whether interest is paid or not all of this have to be tracked from a control perspective also you need to test on this borrowings includes term loans demand loans export credit cash credits oda facilities bills purchase or discounted all of these would get covered as a part of it and if you have non fund basis come getting converted into fund based even those should be considered as outstanding borrowings and this is a very important change that has come to it preference capital is definitely not part of the borrowings so therefore it won't get covered there next whether the company is declared a willful defaulter by any bank or financial institutions or other lenders now willful defaulter now we had covid period there was lot of these challenges came up there were lot of extension that happened lot of these things now the question then comes up are they considered as willful defaulters now how do you identify whether they are willful defaulters the only way you can do is to ask send a confirmation to the bank and each of the bankers have to confirm whether any of the bank loan account or whether this entity itself has been identified as a willful defaulter now confirmation we normally we send confirmation only to get the balances whereas now the confirmation should include what is the type of trans um, uh, borrowings that you have what are the terms of the borrowings what are the covenants of the borrowings what, whether the bank has if declared this entity as, as a willful defaulter all of these becomes very very essential next whether the term loans were applied for the purposes for which were obtained if not the amount of loan so diverted and the purpose for which it is used may be so i'll give you an example here is the bank here is the company we went and withdrew money from a bank and the bank saying that it wanted to purchase fixed assets now they have also applied for working capital loans they that amount was not received and you find that the vendor who was supposed to supply the fixed assets has not supplied the fixed assets i mean the equipment sorry not the fixed assets the equipment now the bank said okay the entity said okay fine anyway i need to use for other plant so let me divert this money let me use this money so when i get back my working capital i replenish it 
that is one the second is i don't make a distinction between a term loan and a current loan i put everything into one bank account or i maintain one account in my books now this is very very important utilization of the term loan for purposes other than for what it been they can have to be reported even so let's say i take a term loan i have not got the i went and parked it somebody else, somewhere else i still need to say it's a debit somebody might say sir it was only to earn interest temporarily deployed still you have to give that information saying that nature of term loan not applied deposited and put a remark saying that temporary deploy, deployment pending receipt of this goods so this is very very critical because if you have to go see earlier what happens for every term loan given and for any receipts the banker always ask you to give a end use certificate whether the company has got this bills have been received has been verified equipment has been capitalized you have to give all the details now as a statutory you have not given because you think that the company is you don't believe the company that's for instance you says no i am my procedure is so stringent i will not be able to issue a term loan certificate or a fund end use certificate now there is another auditor who issued this end use certificate now you found when you are testing this that the end use has got temporary deployment or has got diversion that means what you did is i took this money instead of to the equipment i have used it to as a loans to my uh, i have issued an icd let's say you say sir anyway i was paying that 12 10% i am now giving getting it about 12% so therefore 2% is my leverage so therefore i put it there this is a clear diversion so that means you have to go and see the fund flow of each of this and then address it diversion of funds includes utilization of short term working capital for long term purposes deploying borrowed funds activities for creation of other than the forage loan or sanction transferring borrowed funds to subsidiaries group companies routing of funds through any bank or other lenders through consumer without permission of the lender just routing of funds through any other bank other than the lender bank investment in other companies by acquiring equity debt instrument shortfall in deployment of funds disbursement roll and difference not being accounted for look at the extent of the responsibility that has come up for a term loan and you will find many of the small medium enterprises run on term loans than the working capital loan or working capital loan is used to acquire even capital assets so look at from that perspective next whether funds raised on short term purposes have been utilized for long term purposes again you need to look go back because you can either look at from a liquidity um, through a cash flow statement you can look at it or if you have got sufficient as if you see that internal accruals uh, are sufficient enough to fund the long term funds that you are investing activities you may look at the the operating changes in operating uh, working cap changes in working capital you may probably look at it and then say hey listen you got this is the funds received this is the funds you got your capital asset the additional money is the additional money which is towards capital asset is not being funded by your equity or by long term loan you may probably do a one to one match the other way of matching is called take the all the assets additions during the period or investments and then compare between how these has been uh, funded probably that's another way around but predominantly these are driven from the changes in working capital if the changes in working capital is always changes in working capital is funded by a bank loan or that's called the short term loan or working capital loan you need to make an understanding and then see whether it's been applied if you draw up a cash flow you'll be in a position to explain that next whether the company has taken any funds from any entity or person on account to meet the obligations of its subsidiaries associates joint venture if so details of their of the nature of accounts that means any entity any entity could be bank financial institution liability partnership everybody or person even from an individual 
So entire money that has been drawn during the period and how it has been out utilized all have to be addressed. Earlier, this was not there, but this person has been included, especially if there have been any diversion. These are called as diversions. You have taken money to meet the obligations becomes a diversion. Whether the company has raised loans during the year on pledge of securities held in its subsidiaries, joint ventures or associate companies, if so, provide details thereof and also report if the company is default in repayment of such loans. Now look at this broader aspect of it. Loans raised during the by the company. Loans could be short term, which I told you in example in the earlier slides. Also long term. Two, for all the loans that have been taken and even if it is repaid, you need to, you have to even if it is repaid during the year, that means it is not that it should be outstanding at March 31st. It is raised and repaid during the period. Again, if you need to look at it, if there are any outstanding loans relating to earlier period, you may ask the questions whether should I report that? The answer is no. It is only loans raised during the period and has been applied in respect of subsidies. So it's one way to look at it. This is grandfathering is allowed, but my understanding is that if you have such loans and there has been default in repayment of this, you may have to still give. Raising funds is of the current period is fine, but defaults relating to such loans raised in the earlier period may figure under this. And just look at the important aspect of it. You had subsidiaries, joint ventures, and all that. You use them as the security, and you pledge them, and then on that you have raised them. And I think that's a very important aspect of it. You will find many of the cases. In fact, you will find the other way around. You may probably pledge the uh, the parent company's assets and probably give the loan. But you may also have situations where, if your subsidiary is very very uh, what is called profit making, you may probably use that assets to raise funds and utilize the funds. Next, whether money is raised by the way of initial public offer, including debt instruments were applied for the purposes for which it was taken, if not details together with details of default and liquidation to be provided. That means, when you raise any finance, it says for towards capital, towards capital assets, it'll say towards working capital, towards X, towards repayment, towards all of that. So all of these, whether the amounts that have been taken has been appropriately applied for which it is there. That means the end use even for that offers, including the debt securities have to be included in the definitions. Preferential allotment, there is no change. It remains consistent. There is nothing specific on this, but let's look at the whether fraud. Now, earlier it was fraud on the company and then used to only report. Now, it is both on the company and by the company. Whether any fraud by the company, or any fraud on the company, two things, by the company and on the company. Now, you are the auditor of that company. On the companies, you may have situations wherein some of the officers, some of your employees may be involved in getting money, right? Then unjust enrichment, for, in, uh, for, in, for instance, you may have a situation where somebody is claiming more money or Somebody has identified certain distributor, he will sell it and the discounts comes back to him and those amounts get into his account. So it is on the company because the amount is due to the company, but the, the marketing manager or whoever it is, officer gets benefit. You see the other around, other case, by the company. And you find many of the amounts that are paid towards bribe. Many of the money is paid through the bribe, sit under the employee advances, sit under certain heads. The question is, is that a fraud? The broader aspect of it, the, it is a fraud which is, gets included. So it is important that fraud by the company, I gave an example of wrongly submission to the banker, could be one fraud. Two, under the Companies Act, I take a position. 
under okay. income tax act i can take a position three i can split the accounts split the cash cash transactions so that it does not come under the ambit is that a fraud likelihood of this getting into a fraud the question Sorry, is can me chusa mr krishna can you go on mute please chain and catches law ante basically illo elimination sariga cheyitla avunandi enduku sir entante minority anta mundu lakh rupayale undedi minority interest danto pnl lo nunchi lakh tisse vallu ante share capital plus vaalla share rendu tisse vallu pnl lo nunchi adi nidesh can you put him on mute yeah thanks now this is also very important see unless unlike uh, in tax bar association they don't give a cp credit so therefore they don't get any cp credit now the question of fraud by the company has got larger meanings now for instance to achieve an objective i may create an entry for instance i might say listen i've got advances from the customer i need to supply it let's say two months later or i've supplied in the month of may now i take that advance as my income could that be a fraudulent misstatement the answer is yes you may need to evaluate on a case to case basis now the question which has really come up is if any amounts are in aggregate is greater than 1 crore auditor has to file in adt form now this is the most difficult aspect of it on the company as so on the auditor not on the company because if you say that this amount which is paid which you know is in the nature of fraud a bribe taken or non compliance to an act is a fraud that means if they are splitting the income in such a way that it does not meet it is does not require you to go through the tcs or the deduction uh, tax at source or does not fall under the 40a all this definition a312 and all of that the question then comes up if the intent of the company of the management is to fraud the fraud is to the state the fraud is to the center that means they don't want to pay the central tax they don't want to pay the state tax they don't want to pay the stamp duty they don't want to do it any of this that becomes very very important including it need not be cash alone i may take an accounting position which is not right that also means falsifying accounts so it is important for us a fraud definition see unfortunately we as auditors on who provides us the books of accounts management who provides us the supporting documents management who provides us the information for our audit management what are we doing management prepare accounts management provide supporting management does everything we are putting our signature is that audit so now this question on fraud brings up the question of professional skepticism and going forward fraud is going to play a major role in many of the reports so you may find if anything goes wrong elsewhere it's i always believe this is like a csr csr came up when it was introduced it says you have to only give a provision made in the notes to account then they say no if you have made provision if you have not utilized if you have actually have to identify project provide that means then they say no no you take in this put it in a bank now they are saying keep all of this aside i need an end use certificate please engage forensic auditors into this and understand the nature of frauds that are committed by various companies and i'm telling you let me be very honest with you there is not a single company which does not commit fraud there is every possibility the fraud is committed to what extent the auditors are aware is becomes the other question but it is important that if any fraudulent acts by the management tanta wants to let's say instead of paying a true check i'll say okay let me give by cash even that is a fraud so these are some things which you need to be very very mindful about 
Now, 143, 12, 84, this is something where more than a crore. It's very difficult so far. You know, this is again come back. The gross has come back from MCA saying that none of the auditors, none of the auditors, barring few auditors who have filed ADT4, but majority of the auditors do not file ADT4. And it's very rare. So the biggest challenge is how do you identify? Under the Companies Act, if an, any entity has got more than 50 crores, it requires what is called as visual mechanism to be established. A visual me mechanism is nothing but you need to bring in what is called as, you know, anonymous complaint, uh, help helplines or anonymous mails to be sent to those directors or those people who are responsible, those responsible for governance or those charged with governance. Now, the question is visual mechanism never works. How do you find out saying that if you are a promoter driven company, somebody will come and say the promoter has committed fraud. So the question then comes up with, what is the relevance of it? And this becomes a tricky for many of the auditors and all of the auditors. Why many of the auditors? All of the auditors, this becomes a very tricky issue. Even for listed companies, they don't have. Even for listed companies, why it's called as a whistleblower mechanism, you don't have. But especially where it's in excess of 50 crores for private com limited companies, you need to look at these aspects of it. Nidhi company, I'm just ignoring. Again, related party transactions. This is whether transactions are in compliance and we have to provide details as required under applicable accounting standard related party transaction. The majority of the frauds that happens in India is happens through related party transactions and this related party transactions. You may call whatever arms length under your tax. You may give the adjusted price cost price. You may give market adjustments. You may give comparables. All are just to meet the deadline that is it's within 15% or 20%. That's all as the case may be. Arm's length is something like an undue benefit should not be given to that entity. And it's a very rarity. It's a very rarity that you will find this arm's length failing, failing under any transactions with related parties. I have not come across. I've come across fraud. But I've not come across online transaction because you know, sir, income tax provides, industry provides, this provides, and we are within this. So therefore, it's an excellent transaction. But fraud does happen only through related party transactions. Be mindful on it. Now, this is a very important aspect that has been brought up. Whether the company has an internal audit system commensurate with the size and nature, whether the internal audit reports have been considered. All this while, all this while in the earlier reports, we have always you say we have never looked at internal audit or we have looked at internal audit, but we used to only comment on this nature and size of its business, whether it's commensurate in the nature and size of the business. Today, you need to understand if there are any reporting issues by the internal audit. Now the responsibility is also on the internal auditor. If fraud anything is not reported, internal auditor also would get included as a part of it. So please be careful when you're carrying out an internal audit. If there are any observations, please provide. And the, if you are a statutory auditor, please read every internal audit report issued by the internal audit. If it's internal, internal. If it is external, external internal audit. Whether the company has entered into any non cash transaction, if so, provide under section 192. Now, non cash transactions happen basically, you might transfer certain assets, uh, which are as a part of your settlement. You might do it. So all of these, you need to look at it whether they are anything in compliance with section 192, because restrictions on arrangements to acquire assets from a directors connected for a concern other than cash, unless arrangement is approved by the shareholders in the meeting. So all of these, you need to look at from that perspective. Core finance remains the same. I'm not getting now. This is most important aspect. Whether there has been any resignation by the statutory during that, if so, whether the company has taken into consideration the issues, objections, or concerns raised by the outgoing auditor. Now, there are two things you need to be mindful. Going forward, auditors cannot just resign like this. You can't say I was preoccupied, auditor was busy, or was this. No auditor can resign going forward. If the year is complete, 
if it is appointed in the AGM and the year is complete, there is every likelihood that you may have to complete the audit and provide reasons why you're resigning. This is something which is already in discussions and that will come through. But now it says, see earlier, you see ours is, it was only covered as part of ethics. It was never covered as part of CARO. Now this is getting covered and as part of CARO itself. So if you've got a new, if you've got an audit, don't be happy because the client called you up and said, you know, I, that guy is asking for more fees. So he's asking me for 50,000, I'll do it for 20,000. So you've taken 20,000, tell the auditor that is no longer required. I will, you will do it. But let me be very honest. If the uh, outgoing auditor raises any objection, saying that the management is not fraud, management is, does not, his controls are not there, he has not paid my fees, you cannot accept the audit engagement. Very clear. This is very, very clear. This again will identify, and if the outgoing auditor says he's got no objection, and the incoming auditor comes and says there's a lot of issues, probably that could be one. Or if the outgoing auditor gives a report saying that there are a lot of issues, incoming auditor comes and says there are no issues, that becomes an issue. So these are some things which you need to be very mindful. Come to this main aspect of On the basis of financial ratios, aging and expected dates of realization of assets and payment of liabilities, financial assets and financial liabilities, other information accompanying the financial statements, Auditor's knowledge of board of directors, management plans, whether the auditors of the opinion, no material uncertainty exists as a date of audit report, that the company is able to meet its liabilities within one year. Now, if you recall this aspect of it, predominantly this is drawn from SA 570, which is on going concern. So you give a report on going concern. Now, let's assume that you have prepared a financial statement on a going concern basis. But all these ratios that are given are negative. How will you justify? If you are justifying that these assets ratios are negative, how are the companies got money to manage the business? A lot of things gets at stake. Now, one of the biggest issue when you got a ratio which is negative. So for instance, from a, because these are called as solvency ratios. Right? You look at from a solvency perspective when you're talking about financial assets available to pay the financial liability. Take one instance, current ratio. For every working capital, ideally, ideal is two is to one. But there are rarely any companies which has got two is to one. Majority of the banks agree and settle around 1.3 to 1.5. Now you find that it is not 1.3, it is 1.01 or 0.87. Will you report on going concern? Because in Caro, you put saying that any variance in me and 25%, you will have to recommend. Now, this material uncertainty is a very critical aspect of it. Evaluation using this ratio, you find negative. Your financial statement on going concern, it cannot be on going concern unless there is something else that they have got. They've got some other funding that they've got as a part of the process. So this is a very critical aspect of it when you need to look at it. Again, if CSR specific, if it's an ongoing project, 30 days, other than on ongoing project, you have to deposit within six months. Again, unspent, if there are amounts which are unspent for a amount of year, you put it under unspent corporate social responsibility and later on transfer to that. Now, this is another introduction that has been brought in. Under the Companies Act, the auditors have to present a report on consolidated financial statements. Now, what it says that if any of the subsidiaries, joint venture, associate auditors have a qualification or adverse remarks, such qualification and adverse remarks should be brought into this CARO reporting. Under CARO reporting, for instance, a failure to deposit a provident fund amounts on, on a time or a default in repayment of loans, right? 
you need to be very, very clear because you are going to take the responsibility. Let's say I take a responsibility saying that I don't have to report because I'm fine with this. That is your responsibility. But every adverse or qualified report, qualification in the other entities has to be brought in. And this is only for consolidation, not for anything else. So let's look at focus on schedule three. I know given the time, let me focus on schedule three. So I'll let me take you to specific things and then I'll open it up for question and answers. Now, one of the key changes that have been brought in is the changes in the manner of presentation and information captured under the financial statement. Original requirement of trade receivables was very clear secured considered good, unsecured considered good, and doubtful. Very simple. Now, it has been broken down between undisputed trade receivables and disputed trade receivables. Even within undisputed trade receivables, which are good, which has got significant increase in credit risk or credit risk impaired, or the credit impaired. The question then comes up, where is the significant increase in credit risk? Now, take one example. You are a company which is dealing with, let's say, in pharmaceutical with Russia. You have been producing and selling to that entity in Russia, right? And you've been getting monies. Suddenly, because of this trade embargo, the, because of the war that is happening, these receivables which were considered good now will fall under the con concept of which has significant increase in credit risk. Now look at this. Majority, let's say you've got transaction with government authority, right? Where will you put? Always under considered good? A credit risk impaired? Where will you put? So similarly for disputed trade receivables, Considered good, which has significant in credit risk or credit is impaired. All of these becomes very, very important. That means you need to understand between less than six months, six months to one year, more than one to two years, two to three years, and more than three years. Why this is important is, suppose majority of this fall under three years. So let's instance. So all your trade receivables fall under three years. Under solvency ratio, what is required? That the, my company should be in a position to recover the money. I mean, should be in a position to pay the suppliers or the financial, settle the financial liability. Now, if your majority of the amounts are falling under more than three years, how are you going to deal with it? These are very critical aspects of it that you need to consider. One year is fine, but every year you can't be writing more than three years. So this is a very critical aspect of it, which you need to look at it from a classification. Again, I'm saying connect this dots with the financial ratios, connect this dots with the going concern under say 570. All of these have to be connected, only then you'll be able to. Even within the receivables, if it is disputed, you need to look at from a perspective of whether this dispute is itself is good because you might say I had filed a legal case, legal case they've said it's settled in my favor, good. But legal case is being dragged for long. Do you believe there's a significant increase in credit risk? Or let's say you've lost in first, you have to go for the second level. So whether it is impaired. So all of these becomes critical when you're reporting. Similarly, is in case of MSME, the payables. MSME definition has undergone change. Up to 250 crores, the new definition of small, medium, and micro enterprises have been entered. Small, medium, and micro enterprise. MSME, micro, small, and medium enterprises have been introduced. So when you look at micro, small, medium enterprises, Ranges from 5 crores to 50 crores to 250 crores. 
Now, if you look at this, do you have not? And these changes have come up effective first of July 2020. Do you have sufficient information relating to such parties? You see any MSM, any companies, the companies in the process of updating, the company has sent confirmation, they have not received confirmation. But the company has to publish or provide this information with the with the ROC or with the MCA every half yearly, every six months. At that point in time, you're providing the list. How can you say that you are no, don't have the list of MSME? It is important that every year, the transaction, whenever you up, uh, renew the contract, you need to have this information captured. And this is a very critical aspect of it that needs to be looked at. The other important aspect which was not covered earlier was capital work in progress and intangible assets under it. Many companies carries without capitalizing under CW. Now the requirement is, if you've got a project in progress, provide when did the project start? What was the original date of this project? When was it expected to complete? whether the amount that is expected to complete is greater than what was estimated. All of these have to be captured. In other words, you have to say is, I've saw many of the companies who are sitting with the CW for long, suddenly started capitalizing. This is one shot you will find many companies will do it. Otherwise, what happens is, if it's the CWIP, it's only expenditure which is getting capitalized, nothing more. So this is a very important aspect which has been brought in both for CWAP and for intangible assets under development. Changes in revaluation we talked about. Now, the other change that has been brought in is the share only of promoters. Earlier, it was only 5% and above you need to provide. Now, you have to provide for entire promoters list. Please get the entire DMAT account information from the share registers and provide this information. Other amendments that have been brought in is to disclose if the company makes any loan advances to promoters, directors, KMPs and other related party jointly or severally and without any specific terms or with specific terms provide these details and the nature and the percentage of loans. In fact, you take any balance sheet and I'm telling you if you start with if you love balance sheets, right, you will know how the company is performing. You'll find there are two aspects, three aspects of it. One side is equity and financial liabilities. The other side is financial assets. Today in your, in your presentation, first is assets and excess liabilities. But if you see, other than equity, the majority will be on borrowings or the majority on the asset side will be on debtors or inventories or loans and advances or investments. If you address all of these, we are done with the audit. Unfortunately, we carry out this related party transaction year to get us like this. And there's no movement. Many of the subsidiaries amounts advanced to loans, to loans and advances to subsidy joint ventures. There is no movement. Whereas we are saying, so now you say that current assets is eligible to pay the current liability. So let me give you an example. So you have got loans and advances given to subsidiary. That subsidiary is in loss making. That subsidiary is in loss making. Should you now adjust it? But management says it is, I have stayed in, in, it is my interest in that company. I stay put because I want the subsidiary to perform well. How will you calculate such questions? And I think this becomes very, very essential. There are other disclosures which have undergone change, like the current maturity is non-current, non uh, from a non-current borrowing is gone to short-term money, which is right. The other new requirement is security bank deposit, which has already been done, which is there's no much of change. Undisclosed income, you need to bring in CSR. They have brought in aspects of it. Equities, again, this is where I was telling you, if there are any errors that have been identified, if there are any prior period changes, you have to do it under, and this is again for division one companies, basically these are predominantly which is following index. 
where you need to put the additional changes is called restated balance sheet is what will come into it other statements is current assets current liabilities informations requirement with disbursement of funds all have to be provided benami transactions declaration of as and the billful defaulter this has to be provided registration of charges again from an roc perspective utilization of borrowed funds cryptocurrency or virtual currency these are the ratios that are be provided these are called as the solvency ratios current ratio debt equity debt serviceable ratio return on equity inventory turnover ratio trade receivables trade payables net cover all of these need to be looked at it on this and if there are any variances beyond 25% such variances have to be explained on ongoing basis again this section 287 where you cannot have more than two layers and this is again um, if there have got more than two layers in the structure you need to provide that information this is a very very important aspect relating to relationship with stock of companies relationship with stock of companies now has become a big issue if you have got relationship means what you got transaction with them investments receivables payables shares held by the stock of company other outstanding balances now you come across and it is actually we have come across with many of the companies that we have identified and these companies are not in existence but their amounts are being carried out because it's a very minuscule amount of 20000 30000 40000 like that this is how do you verify it somebody asked how do you verify there is an mca website which gives you company stock of companies go to that and you will find out the entire list using the sin number you will be able to identify all of this here is the problem the companies are being struck off right let's say in struck off in 2018 but still the company has got majority of the transaction with this after the company struck off what does it mean it means that the transaction are sham transaction this is a very important change this will have far reaching implications on ourselves as well as on the reporting there are few changes that have been brought in under rule 11e and 11f and especially 11e talks about any funds right have been advanced or loaned or invested including foreign entities or intermediaries where the ultimate beneficiaries because it is done on behalf of ultimate beneficiaries you need to identify whether the management has no funds have been diverted or received or recorded on behalf of such ultimate beneficiaries this is a very important aspect of it as because many of the companies having foreign entities where there is no direct holding it does not figure under uh, what is called related party transactions it is again held by group of people but when the parent when that entity invests in this company it invests only 10% whereas that 10% is held by those five people and that five people becomes the ultimate beneficiaries those people also need to figure it and you need to provide information as well this is a very very important change under the auditors report so therefore in 11e and f 11e is this 11f is basically on dividend paid So, if there are any dividends paid during the year, you need to provide what is the interim dividend paid, what is the how is the profit determined, and all of that. All right. So, this is was my presentation for. I do understand uh, for about one hour forty minutes. The twenty minutes is open for you. Any questions that you have? Ready, sir? What do you? Oh. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, good afternoon. This is Vijay Kumar here. Yeah, Vijay Kumar. Sir, uh, basically, uh, you know, last year the government has given the emergency credit line guarantee scheme. Right. Uh, yeah. The company, the companies are getting thirty uh, percent or thirty percent depends upon the eligibility. Uh, uh, without any reference to the turnovers, maximum turnover is given hundred crores, but uh, without reference to any uh, utilization of uh, funds. So they're just giving the funds. 
So in that sense, uh, how, how do we report in this curve? The 20, no, no, you just rephrase the question, 20 percent, the government is giving 20 percent. Government is, uh, under government scheme, banks are giving to the companies 20 percent of the existing liability of loans. Banks are giving 20 percent back. Yeah, see, suppose the company is having 100 crores, so 20 crores uh, under the scheme, the uh, bank is given to the clients. Correct. So, that is so difference that 20. Is that is loan given. It's not a subsidy. Yeah. It's a loan, loan given. given. Loan given. Loan given. Yeah. So, so there is no requirement of fund utilization there. No, 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 no. Loan given again. That you have to service that loan. Yeah, you have to it's service the loan. You have to pay the interest. Yes. You have to pay. The, you have to pay the interest. You have to pay the principal. No, end use certificate is required. No. Uh, correct. That's what I'm saying. So therefore, you have to provide that in this information. Any loans. Any loans, grants, anything where you are servicing it, mm -hmm. unless it's a grant which says to establish this flat, you are very, we are very happy. Twenty crores, you take, enjoy yourself, no, no problem. This subsidy we will not even ask you. That's a different question. If the twenty crores have been given by the bank as a part of this, you know, the, the, during the COVID period, at that point in time, it is basically to keep your plant and everything running or, or make sure that you know, there's, there's no suffering. The question then is, this amount is payable back to the banks? Yes. If it is payable to the banks, then it's a loan. It's, a loan, it's, only, no, it's a loan only. The purpose for which it has been sanctioned doesn't have, right? So the end use of the funds, how to report it? No, no, no. It will be there. It would be say for working capital interest. They're saying, uh, uh, yeah. It will be for working capital loan. So working capital thumb loan, they're saying it. Yeah, it will be specific. So the question is, see, see the emergency credit lines, the guarantees. You see, these are all what is that for? This is for to manage your working capital. The question of working, see, the end use of funds come. When does the end use funds come? When I take a loan for a particular purpose, I'll say, I want to build up this plant, new plant I'm coming up, I need. So give me a working capital, working capital, sorry, give me a term loan. I may come up with a working capital term loan because my time to take the inventory, to convert that inventory into period, it is much larger. It is not within one year. It takes about two or three years. That is what becomes a term loan. That means when I'm not in a post, that means the company was not in a position to service it. And it says comes up with a period of repayment schedule. That's called term loan. That means schedule of five periods that's with you need to do. End use comes when you've taken loans for what purpose? Even for ca working capital you have taken. And I've used it for, why did I get the emergency line? Emergency line of credit because to run the operations. I've kind of put it in my fixed assets or I went and invested in uh, some subsidiaries or some, let's say invested in something else. There also you need to bring that because the purpose of emergency line of credit or the purpose of this 20% sanction is for a particular purpose of operations. But if instead of using an operation, I've used it for something else, I need to get that. Done. You have to report. Uh, and I have a second question. Yes, sir. With, with respect to uh, recent change in the uh, classification of advance with respect to capital assets, acquisition of capital assets. When you make the advances, earlier it is part of working uh, capital working progress, depends upon the company policy. Now they made it as a part of capital advance separately as a non current asset. In that sense, whether the classification of one year, two year, three years, that has to be reported here or not required? So the, the advances, see, this is basically capital working progress. Capital advances is different, capital working progress is different. Capital work in progress is what? What is it? It is an asset that has been put. You got money paid to this contractor. He has not supplied you. Right? Right. The capital work in progress is when does it when it has become you don't clubbing it now. You're not clubbing it with capital work in progress. Assets, capital advance sits in the asset side. This capital work in progress sits on the fixed asset side. Right. So you're only giving to the nature of the fixed assets. 
there you would say original contract was this this is the amount which is required this is spent balance to be spent balance to be spent is minus that capital thank you okay so the emergency loan i've told where does the provision relating to registration of charges and schedule be applied to loan agreements entered into the current year or also earlier as the point is that registration of charges if it is outstanding at the beginning of the year even that also would be. so the charges have to be in complete definitely for the current year but in the earlier period for earlier loans for earlier banks if you have not done you may probably want to include them again i'm saying let me be very honest with you as an auditor under caru provide as much as information in in the report because if you don't provide, take provide in the report it becomes our response don't use judgments here there is no client favors please don't do any client favors this is a responsibility if we fail in our responsibility government has got every right to question us gone are the days where we could have said that we are true and fair now the true and fair has gone away okay now it is true and correct when the government is asking you fraud has happened please ask me. because you say fraud has happened let me tell you there is one case which has happened uh, where the the employee was taking money from the carrying and forwarding agents okay now the question is is it a fraud on the company the answer is is a management over it the answer is yes then the question is if the management is aware and the fraud has happened is it fraud by the management the answer is yes so be aware of this if no action is taken on that person it means the fraud is done by the management so we have larger responsibility in respect of caro because now it has gone to evidences against basis of explanations and information flow it's now gone to obtaining and seeking evidences seeking evidences means going and examining the books of records and from those books and records you will come up to right any other question mithal sahab aapke aapke tax bar to sab knowledgeable bahut hai sir koi questions hi nahi hai haan ji sir आपने इतना अच्छा एक्सप्लेन किया सब थैंक्स वेरी मच भाई आपको एल आई सी के डायरेक्टर हो आपको थैंक यू सर मैं तो मैं आपका आते समझा ठीक है बंग साहब तो पूछ ले एनी अदर क्वेश्चन एनी एनी थिंग आई एम टेलिंग अगेन आई एम टेलिंग यू टाइम एंड अगेन वी हैव टू बी कॉग्नजेंट नाउ आर रिपोर्टिंग इज गॉन टू ledger balances take ledger balances and report that's it summary of ledger balances take it and report loans advances to subsidiaries joint venture associate or any other parties focus on on that adequacy of ratios focus on all the current assets current liabilities put that ratios this you have to be focused there is if you look at borrowings if you look at loans and advances if you look at uh, the other current assets inventory and everything and fixed assets we are done then only come and do on it first to obtain evidence first ledger accounts then do start audit then you will have opinion on financial statement krishna mangaro krishna mangaro krishna with the having yeah. always <laughs> <laughs> and no sir as per your uh, yours uh, delivery see i think going forward in the car we should not mention based on the information ex information express provide to us <laughs> you said that we need to give the factual information so i think uh, using the word is uh, totally will be incorrect method 
are still my my question is still can you write that and take some shelter at least in few places like uh, uh, there is one uh, non cash transactions you know that uh, i understand non cash transactions how will you take non cash transaction means that there is an asset which has gone from your balance sheet it would have fixed as it would have gone how can you say you will based on information provided there could have been situation where a commission could have been settled Yes. Commission should be paid in cash. Do you find commission is not paid? Oh, he could illoon that the banjar rails through these respond and interest there. I'm just telling you, you don't yeah. even do a fair value. You just give it. So those are things are prohibited. So that's the reason I'm bringing it. Yeah, yeah. It's an intent why they because, brought this concept. See, because the reason is that 15 point non cash. Why I'm asking, since it is no amount is involved, we can't see in the books of accounts. No entry can be passed. So they are definitely be real on them only, na? No. See what is the question here? Whether the company has entered into any non-cash, non-cash? You mean to say barter, barter kind of transactions like that? No, debit, debit. See, I have to, I have to pay you commission, yeah. right? You are a director. Me runna ro na ko. I like this every movie na baad baad pakka na ko ke illu gawala antar. That company yeah. the building. The company says, okay, no problem. I will not pay you commission. You take the building. That is adjustment. You. You show fixed assets as removed from assets, and commission as an expense and uh, from your payables. Then That's all, all J- then all JV entries what we pass <laughs> used to be under lens. <laughs> oh, there you come. That's exactly what they want. That's exactly what it is. We are general entries only. So what? <laughs> what all thirty first March twenty two entries? What the general entries day? All it is will be under, uh, I think, under reporting then. No, so no. we create some expenditure. And... No, no, it's not expenditure. It's a main cash you are sending with any asset, fixed assets, cani, alant or shares, cani. If you are giving shares, cani. Something like that. Cash, and it is cash in, cash out. There is no cash in, cash out. That's called non-cash. I think we can eliminate the expenditure part, like directors and general pay. They will not withdraw. Or some kind of, uh, I mean, when, suppose when you pay rent to the director, we do in IT complaints, but they may not draw because of the they want to use the infuse the funds into the company. Those kind of things, I think, based on our judgment, we can write. That's what I want to say. No judgment, sir. <laughs> no, dis- <laughs> no discretionary, no judgment. <laughs> again, I'm telling you. Again, I'm telling you. Paro 2020s evidences obtained. Yeah, that's what that word is very really catchy and. Uh, I think that is that plays major role. That what what we are using on the factual year reporting. Exactly. Now, per Krishna Mohan, he wrote now Mohan Ilan. That is factual. Okay. Chinnam mm. Krishna Mohan Ilan or Ala Gaz Nag. That's the point. So there is a question which came up in small companies. You may not find all this absolutely. This is where the whole challenge is. More than seven lakh companies fall under. If you are an auditor and reporting under Caro. If you do not have information, I would say qualify for it. Not worth it, boss. A little bit very much. Not worth it, boss. Not worth. If you are paying for huge cash, sorry, huge fees, then you can take the risk. No company pays good fees to the auditor. Okay, so be mindful of it. Be responsible. So the question, which another question came up, as the audit gone back to balance sheet with evidence correlation, answer is yes. Today. I'm telling you, or the Companies Act, the Ocaro requires us to report on fraud. Fraud, clearly. You mean to say we don't know frauds? We will know frauds. So the point is, are we reporting? The answer is no. My experience with as a insolvency professional is, uh, audited balance sheet when it comes to IP, except for the fixed assets, most of the data are not recoverable. most of the advances are not recoverable and so that is where a huge difference is coming sir as a budget balance sheet and the same balance sheet when it is viewed from the it's perspective never we see whether the, you know, the limitation act is it applicable or not to a data because the confirmations are not taken finally when a recovery comes it becomes very difficult to answer so what you are saying is correct sir so from the bankers perspective now stringent uh, procedures have been applied to all cases Sir, you are you are on mute. You are on mute. Sir, you are you are absolutely right. 
this is exactly where it has come from. When I say regulators have come through, this is exactly what I'm telling you. People like I B I like Ritesh, अरे भाई कुछ तो पैसा नहीं है क्या पैसा पे करूँगा बोलेगा बोला यार ये आर्डर कर रहा क्या है तुम्हें बोला ये आर्डर कर रहा है ये तो पूरे वो लोग सुन लिया वो याद है Ritesh भाई जहाँ भी बोलेगा तो लगा दिया चुपली लगा दियो Financial literacy for auditee and their staff is more important than doing the work through our auditor staff and office. No, I wouldn't say the financial literacy is very important. I would rather would say we as an auditor should explain to the auditee the purpose why we are doing. It. Unfortunately, what has happened is we always take the responsibility on us. Come, they claim yes, sir. I'm they claim yes. We will do it. Not an issue. अच्छा इंटरनल कंट्रोल नहीं सर ये दिस इज वेरी ओनली फॉर रिपोर्टिंग नॉट व्हेन वी स्टार्ट ओनिंग इट दैट्स वेयर द ऑडिटी एंड द ऑडिटर बिकम्स द सेम व्हेन द ऑडिटर गोस टू द ऑडिटी एंड एक्सप्लेन्स दैट दिस इज योर रिस्पांसिबिलिटी प्रोबेब्ली दैट विल बी वेरी वेरी दैट प्ले वे मेजर रोल आई थिंक आई एग्री विद यू आई थिंक वी हैव टू ड्राइव दिस नॉलेज दिस लिटरेसी विद द ऑडिटी एंड द स्टाफ Then with ourselves, because we have to educate and say you own this baby. We are only giving an opinion on this. You can't be writing in the audit report saying the responsibility of the audit financial is the responsibility of the management. Our responsibility is to an audit opinion. No longer is going to hold. It is the responsibility of the management to understand why this balance sheet information is provided, why this information is important from a perspective. How will it come back to you? At a later point, every year you can't say more than three years, more than three years. How many years you say it has more than three years? That means these are not recurring figures. And you say I'm staying interested in in the what is called as my subsidiaries. How long will you stay interested? Because your brother-in-law is there, sister-in-law is there, or son-in-law is there. They are running this. Therefore, it becomes your subsidiary. So I think things will change. Things has to change. Sir, one thing. Sir, one thing. Yeah, Ganesh, sir. I think you see during your presentation regarding the uh, presentation of or I mean submitting the re uh, returns or reports to the banks. You mentioned one uh, concern which I feel more concern is that by submitting the documents, if we get more facility than what you are eligible, can why not can be converted? Why cannot be treated as a fraud? I think it is a <laughs> bit. Uh, Uh, <laughs> so you, you no no you presented such a way that that getting more facility than what will cause a fraud then uh, i think uh, i think we need to <laughs> it will be very more, more careful whether because of this reason we need to comment whether any fraud by the company on the company is there that also we need to comment and it is linked to ifc so when you are uh, you are eligible for 100 rupees and you are showing you 120 and claiming some excess amount that means ifc is for that means the whole caro fails ifc fail Means means I mean, car is negative, two points plus two plus negative, IFC negative. So I think um, such kind of things also considering as a fraud is, I think at all for that is correct. So just I want to hand no, it on that. No, it is true. It is true. It is going to come. It, the very purpose of a fraud, I'm telling you, the very purpose of a fraud is my intent is to get more from the bank. My intent, I don't have. So I'm cheating. So is a project report. I am coming back to project reports. So what happens is today, if you go for any loan, uh, what is called concession to loan, you have to go back to the day one when you provided what is a project report, what was the projection given, what is the project, what is the financial status now, and what is it impact? And they what it says is. Is it because of operation? Is it because of valuation? Suppose in your project report you said in a hundred crores, eighty, sixty crores is let's say fixed assets, thirty crores is let's say current assets, six crores is you say loans and advances. Okay. Yeah. Whereas in the actual now, instead of sixty crores, twenty crores is fixed assets, forty crores is thirty uh, crores is current assets. And the balance sixty crores. 
Now the question comes up: Is it where the inflow diversion has happened, and that's where it's being called up? It's it's a very important point, and each one of us have to start looking at it. Is there any other question which I have not answered? Because I'm not able to see if there are any questions I missed out. In the chat, I've already answered. But is there any other question? There is one more question, sir. Why the financial statements are the responsibility of the management? The government and ICI will pounce on the CA first, and then maybe the auditor. Why the? This must be our friend uh, Satyam. So, what, what is the question? Why is the? Financial statements are the responsibility of the management. The government and ICI will pounce on the CA first, and then maybe the auditor. Correct. Because who is the easiest bakra? <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, अरे boss पूरे GST something goes wrong. Who is the first guy to be arrested? Not the person who is committed fraud. Wait. The person who has issued the certificate is the person. <laughs> so he is supposed to know everything. That's unfortunate. No, see, this is where, in fact, yesterday I was in Calcutta and I was with the president of ICI. I was telling exactly the same thing. We are not empowering the professionals. The day we empower, like our advocate uh, Narsim Mohan Reddy, Reddy Garuga, Narsim Reddy Garuga, empowering by the bar council, that's the day when you will find everything, everyone together. Otherwise, my Ritesh Mittal Bai will say. अरे पूरा बैलेंस जो आईबीपी है सब बेकार है यार कुछ भी रिकवरेबल नहीं है अल्टर ने कार्य पहने क्या कुछ भी नहीं क्या आईबीपी प्रोफेशनल वो इस पर्सन इश्यूइंग सर्टिफिकेट चार्ट अकाउंट एंड यू आर टेलिंग द चार्ट अकाउंट इज नॉट डूइंग द बैंकर लिसेंस आह और रजिस्टर्स ओ दिस चार्ट अकाउंट इस � Exactly. The direction is very clear. They are now saying, if you have been with the company for long, that means staying invested, you know the books of account, you know the ledgers, you know the accounts. Why is that you are not able to identify this? It's a very big question. Very big question. There is no answers to it. Answer. Five baj gaya. But yes, sir. Any other question? I think we'll. Uh... Uh, sir, I have one question. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. So there is an amendment to Schedule Three, right? Ah. Uh, I I remember that that is not a tax audit, uh, where the non corporates doesn't have a format. They have to follow the Schedule Six code, right? Now the that is not has not amended, but can we take that in the Schedule Six, Schedule Three to be applied? And if it is applied, then all non-corporate has to follow the same. This is this is where the whole issue is. If for Form 3CA, it is not applicable. You you don't get into all of this. If Schedule 3 is not applicable, don't say Schedule 3 is not applicable. It's only form and a balance sheet. If you go into that details, then you run into problem. I will not go, sir. But the department they may come up with this kind of issues, right? You should say, sir, this is not under Companies Act, therefore not applicable. I will take that stand. I will take that stand. But in case, in it's case. a likelihood, sir. It's a likelihood. You are absolutely right because there is no format given. It's a likelihood. So therefore, you bank on uh, guidance note issue that is not applicable. So since guidance note are not updated, no, you use that guidance note or use the Schedule Three itself, saying that under the Rule Companies Act Rule Section this thing. This is only applicable to Division One, Division Two, Division Three, and not applicable to this company. And from there you start. Wali wali ke section jo question sir. Otherwise ask advocate team ready or and if the what he said is right sir. I'm a face it is does not fall under company tax. Exactly. That's why why should you dis why should you discuss further. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, for enlightening us on the topic. Schedule three and uh, arrow reporting. 
we members of the Telangana and Andhra Pradesh Fat Bar Association are enriched with the knowledge that was shared with us, sir. Thank you so much once again. I hope thank all you. the questions are answered. However, if any further questions left over, kindly please post them to the email ID. Will be answered accordingly. Now I request Sri uh, Leela T A Leela Krishna Mohan to propose the vote. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity to give a vote of thanks for the uh, speaker like uh, Ganesh, sir. It's an honor for me. Uh, thank you, Ganesh Karu. Thank you very much for your wonderful, nice presentation. You have touched very sensitive points and it is making us, all the participants, to throw some light and uh, the thought process should change, I think, going forward. So, but very, very critical points you made, uh, seeing, uh, considering that it is based on the factual information presenting the Karu report, not based on the, some kind of information explanation. There is a scope for room and for that. And also you linked that to IFC and the main report. And uh, one thing which I felt very happy that first you do the Caro reporting, then you come to your framing your audit report. I think this is one kind of uh, uh, better way of uh, our going forward. Because generally we prepare the main report, then we come and fill the Caro. That is a process. But I think this will be really make us, and this new Caro will make the uh, presentation of the management by all the uh, entrepreneurs industries make further strong and uh, thank you very much and i uh, uh, just to inform all the uh, nearest nearly 60 by 70 members have attended this and uh, they are continuously uh, watching this that's what we uh, observed uh, uh, yeah, 76, uh, 76 is the highest number thank you thank you sir, so much and uh, i hope many people have benefited out of mr ganesh uh, presentation of course always he rocks in the auditing and assurance <laughs> Recently, three days, four days back also, I have attended sir's speech and this is like a revision for me. Really heavy, happy to see Ganesh Kara and we expect many more sessions from you for the benefit of our tax bar members. Thank you. Thank you so much. And over to TN Reddy. One thing I would like to supplement. Ganesh ji, even though he's a chartered accountant, but the way in which he speaks, you know, the phrase wise, word wise, hmm. really excellent, <laughs> sir. Really excellent. Really excellent. Keep it up. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. This is thanks to the end of the session. Thank you.